Yeah, thank you um, for the opportunity to come here. And uh, I, should, I guess I should say thank you and then say I'm sorry because um, I know originally you were asked that it was, you guys asked to have Alistair come and he is on sabbatical. So uh, you got one of his, his chumps that work for him. So um, yeah, with all that being said, um, it really is a privilege to come and open up the scriptures um, with you. And if you would, would you please take your Bibles and open up to Philippians and chapter 2. Philippians 2. And what I'll do is I will read for us just the, the first 11 verses there uh, in the book of Philippians chapter 2. And uh, then we will kind of work through them together. So let's, uh, let's hear from the word of the Lord. Paul writes in verse 1, So if, the, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let me just pray for us. Father, we do pray tonight that as we have enjoyed such a great meal that we would now come in here to sit under the teaching of your word as we think about, uh, in particular, this topic of relationships. We ask, Lord, that the truth of the gospel and what Paul communicates here would actually become the very things that shape our lives as well. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I was asked to speak on the topic of relationships this evening, and I think that certainly it is a, uh, a fitting topic, especially in today's culture. From both within the church and outside the church, we, we, we see what we could say is a, a strain on relationships. Now, being that this is the first time I've ever been here, I don't know the dynamics of your church necessarily and how the relationships are within your church, but... At this season at Parkside, I can say that it seems as if recently we have had more requests for things like marriage counseling and couples counseling, all these different things than I've seen in the six years that I've been a pastor there. Right? We look at the church, we look at the culture, and we see the breaking down of relationships based on a host of different issues from wars to politics to all sorts of different things. But when it comes particularly to the life of the church, the importance of relationships cannot be expressed enough because relationships actually lie at the heart of the gospel. We think about first our relationship with God. We start in a position estranged from Him. Right? Given that we are sinners and have been, as the Bible says, united to our forefather Adam, we find ourselves outside of Christ and estranged from the God who created us. But what do we find God doing in the world? God is at work bringing about the reconciliation of himself and his people through the work of his son. God in Christ has reconciled us to himself bringing peace through the blood of his cross. But it's also not merely our relationships with God that is reconciled in the gospel. It's also our relationships with one another in the church. 
But as, as you study the Apostle Paul and you begin to understand his theology, we come to realize that, that God doesn't just save us as individuals and then leave us to sort of rummage about our Christian lives on our own. But when he saves us, he actually brings us into a family. This family that we call the church. Right, the, the gospel has both, both vertical and, and horizontal dimensions. Vertically in Christ, we have been brought back into relationship with our Father in heaven, but horizontally, we've been brought into relationship with one another. The point being this, that having been united together as one in Christ, we should then live together as one for the sake of Christ. This was the desire of Jesus, if you remember in his high priestly prayer in, in John. He prays, Father, I desire that those whom believe in me may be one even as you are in me and I in you. That they, the people of God, may be one as we are one. So when we, when we approach this topic of relationships, we see it's important because the, the gospel that we believe and preach has something to say about relationships. It has bearing not only for our souls, but also for our life as a church. Now, as we come to a passage like this in Philippians, this is exactly what Paul thought as he approaches this passage that we read. The church in Philippi, for, for all its intents and purposes, is a relatively healthy church. They had served in the past with the Apostle Paul. They had provided money for other churches, even though they themselves didn't have much themselves. Paul sees in them this growth in grace, and he is joyful about this church. But even though this church is relatively healthy, he sees within it some seeds of difficulty being planted that, that he doesn't want to grow. He actually wants to cut it off before it even takes root. There are those who in this church and in Philippi are trying to undercut the message of the gospel. There are those who are, are causing persecution from the outside that are pressing in on this church. But he also sees seeds of division beginning to take place that are threatening the relationships that exist within the church. In fact, at the very end of this letter, there are two ladies who are evidently at odds with one another that actually serve as an example of the problem that Paul is addressing. And at the very end of the letter, after he has expounded how we as a people of God are to partner together for the sake of the gospel, he says, I entreat you to agree in the Lord. And so as he pins this letter here, his main purpose is to instruct the people of God in how they're to strive together in unity for the sake of the gospel. To, to live lives, as he says in chapter 1, verse 27, that are consistent with the very gospel that they speak from their lips. And the heartbeat of his instruction here in order to how to do that lies in 2, 1 to 11. Really, that's the heartbeat of this book. It what keeps the blood of this book pumping. He essentially instructs these Christians that if they're to walk in a manner that's consistent with the gospel, this is the very shape that their lives must take. It must be shaped by the cross. Right? For Paul, his heartbeat for them and therefore for us today is that as we strive for unity, as we strive to preserve and maintain these relationships in the church, we do this not just for unity's sake, but for the gospel's sake. And the only way we can do that is to live lives shaped by the cross of Christ. So as we come to this passage, I want us to look at this passage just as instructive for us this evening as to how we can keep and maintain relationships in the body. How you as a church can actually build those relationships, keep those relationships, and maintain them. And the first thing we want to do is to hear Paul's call to strive for unity at all cost within the church. And you see that up here on the outline. Paul starts here in, in verse 1 of chapter 2, and you notice he, he doesn't immediately launch into his command for the church and telling them to strive for unity. But he actually establishes the foundation for unity so that we might build upon it. 
In other words, he's in a sense setting up solid ground for us to build upon. You listen to the language again in verse 1. He says, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from his, his love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy. Right? We look at the last two and a half years with everything that has gone by between COVID to politics to race relations, you name it. I think we can say that we have seen that these different things have revealed the fact that some churches, and Parkside is included in this, some churches have somewhat coasted as to how they have sought to maintain their unity as a body. Right Prior to everything that's gone on within conservative churches, we've tended to agree on majority issues, and those issues that we disagreed on, we were able to kind of sweep them under the rug and just not talk about them. But with all that's gone on over the last two and a half years, we've seen that the unities that churches once had were shown to be somewhat fickle. Right? All of a sudden, there were fights amongst church members, arguments amongst church members. We had this in our church where people were fighting if you wore a mask, if you didn't wear a mask, if, if you were vaccinated or unvaccinated, if you were whoever you voted for. And you know what? The good thing about these problems was that it exposed the problem itself. The problem being that many times in our churches we tend to stake our unity on things that are as solid and secure as a leaf that blows in the wind. But if as a church, broadly speaking, as a local congregation, is to keep and maintain these relationships, Paul says here that there's one foundation to build upon. And that's the Christian's shared union in Christ. You hear the language, if there's any encouragement, how? In Christ. If there's any comfort from His love. If there's any participation in the Spirit. You notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say if there's any encouragement in the fact that we all voted the same way. He doesn't say if there's any comfort from the fact that we've all been vaccinated. No, for Paul, there's a deeper and unshakable reality that has actually bound each one of us together who believe in Christ, and that is Christ himself. Right? As, as we've trusted in Christ by faith, we've been organically united to him so that the sphere in which we now live, that you and I now operate as a church, is in Christ. And as the consequence of that, he calls us here to live lives that are consistent with that very reality. Right? You look at this first verse, we might even say what Paul is describing here is not only the foundation of our unity, but it's a wonderful picture of how the church is to see itself. Right? As, as people who have been united to Christ, we're encouraged by Him in all sorts of ways. And so what do we do? Paul says, if there's any encouragement in Christ, then what are you to do? You're to encourage one another. Because what has God done in Christ? Well, He has lifted us up when we're down. He gives us strength when we're weak. And so at the same time, what are we to do? We're to do that for one another. And the same follows with the rest of the stuff that he says here in verse 1. If we're comforted by his love for us, remembering that at one time we were estranged from him, well, then what do we do? We are unworthy recipients of that love. And so what do we do? We show that love to other unworthy people. All of these are realities which are ours in Jesus to be shared mutually as a church. It's a, it's a picture of the church being who she was meant to be. Now you notice as well in the very first verse, Paul starts this phrase with an if clause. It's a conditional clause. He says, if these things are present in the church, if you are seeing yourself grounded and rooted in Christ, then you can strive for this way. Strive for unity. Unity. 
There's a sense in which he, hold the, he holds these things out for us, saying, dear brothers and sisters, these are blessings which are yours in Christ, and I want you to capitalize on them. I want you to realize all that is yours in Christ and then use it for the sake of the body. But there's also another sense in this first verse where we should take an honest assessment of ourselves as a church. Right? Asking ourselves, what, am I, what, what are we basing our relationships on in the church? You might even ask this personally in your marriage. Maybe you're a Christian and you're married. The same thing can be asked, what am I basing my marriage on? Maybe you're not married. Maybe you're a seasoned saint in the church. And the question for you is, am I capitalizing on all that is mine in Christ and using it to promote the unity of the body? Because you, as you look at the passage for Paul, this is the foundation. And this very foundation is what he then uses to give the impetus of this call. You look in verse 2. After he has said all these things, he says, then complete my joy. How? By being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Literally translated, this is, Paul is saying, bring my joy to the full. Now what's implied here is the notion that Paul is already joyful. He already has joy as a result of knowing this church and being, having been involved with this church. Certainly from the beginning of chapter 1, these people have brought great joy to Paul's heart. They've served side by side with him for the sake of the gospel. And I just want to pause and encourage you here for a moment because the fact that you are all here means that somehow and in some way God is at work in you. Right? You should be encouraged by the fact that the sovereign Lord of the universe is bent on bringing about the good of your salvation and the glory of His name. But that also means that we don't stop here. That is actually to be an encouragement to us not to grow lax in our striving to preserve the unity of the body. Because what Paul desires from the church is that as they strive for unity at all cost, he wants them in verse 2 to be united in focus and purpose. You hear the language that he uses. I want you to be of the same mind, having the same love, being of full accord, that is, united in heart and desire. If we were to simply define what he means here, his desire is that we as Christians, you as a church, might work together and strive together for one common purpose and goal. And what is that goal? That we would magnify Christ both with our lips, but also with our lives. And part of that is how we deal with one, with one another. Right? When we find our focus on being, or when we find our focus being Christ and our goal being His glory, we find ourselves being brought together with this, this common yoke that is pulling each other in the same direction. You might remember the day after 9-11. I remember that, and I was in fourth grade. I remember the teacher going out the classroom, coming back in the classroom, turning on the TV, and just being in shock. That day, my, my grandmother picked me up from school. We went back to her house, and the TV was on for hours until my mom picked me up from my grandmother's house. But you might remember also the very next day what happened it was almost as if there was a hard reset on the United States. People came together for a common purpose, for a common goal. Right? Everything else took a back seat. What, what mattered was caring for one another, was caring for your neighbor, laying down personal preferences, grudges, agendas, whatever they may be, and working for the common good of your brother and your sister. And friends, how much more must this be for the sake of Christ and His church? 
Right? These people next to you are people for whom Christ has died. He has shed his blood for them. I think we can lay aside peripheral things for the sake of Christ, don't you? Now, I'm not saying this is easy, because it's not. It's actually hard work, and you want to know why it's hard work. Because coming to an end of ourselves is hard. Right? We're the ones who tend to build up our own obstacles that actually get in the way of this. I'm just as guilty of this as a pastor. Being bent on my own personal preferences and priorities, and those things can tend to drive the ship, but you know what happens when they drive the ship? It crashes. It sinks the ship. When we begin to assert ourselves... Rather than, as Jesus calls all of his disciples to do, then die to ourselves, we tend to run a crash course, fracturing the church and those relationships and just leaving in its wake a stream of hurt. But you see where, you see where Paul takes us. If we're to maintain these relationships and strive for unity in the body, he tells us what we must do. Instead of being so inward focused, you see where he shifts our focus. Not inward, but outward. You see this in verses 3 to 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. You see, particularly in verse 3, do nothing, nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Paul, Paul, conceit. Paul in this instance is prohibiting any sense of self-seeking and self-assertion. Right? If we engage in this type of attitude and we treat relationships as, as rungs on a ladder that we try to climb up in order to make a spectacle for ourselves, it leaves a terrible thing. Or we treat people as stepping stones in order to complete our own goals. And the danger of all of this is that it can be done and look very Christian. Right? What is translated here for conceit actually carries with it the idea of empty glory. It's this type of lifestyle that looks like a a polished facade. It looks nice on the the outside, but just like the Pharisees in Jesus' day, there's there's actually no life on the inside. You can serve in the name of Christ, but it's really just the glory for, for myself. Friends, this is hard stuff. I understand that, but I hope you see why it's so crucial. Because as we strive to maintain the unity and relationships in the church, these are the things that must take place. Right? It's such a temptation for me as a pastor, and I can actually give you an example as to why this is hard. I genuinely, in our church, love to preach and teach the Bible. There is nothing in ministry that I get more joy out of than doing that. But you know what makes it hard? Is that I can make preaching about me. I can use it as a stepping stone for my own glory and recognition rather than reg- recognition, rather than for the glory of God. And the funny thing is that I'm not even that good at it. But I use it for myself. Even so, another practical example. I see this in some of our marriages at our church. Right, when people come in for counseling, you know what I often find is the number one major problem? It's right here in verses 3 to 4. There is at the heart of the marriage not a sacrificing for the sake of the other. But what's involved? There's nothing but selfish ambition, entitlement, a desire to win. And what does it do? It fractures a relationship. Right? There is a warning that is implicit in this passage which essentially says we should never see our relationships in the church 
through a lens that causes us to say, what can I get out of you? Because you see what Paul calls us to do. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count or reckon others more valuable than yourselves. That is completely countercultural. But it's not only countercultural, it's counter natural. <laughs> That's not our natural disposition, our natural way of thinking. You read that slowly one more time. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more valuable than yourselves. You see this type of disposition or attitude that will cultivate humility? What is it? It's one of self-emptying and self-denying humility. You may have heard this before, but you know how C.S. Lewis defined humility? He said, humility is not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less. That's exactly what Paul calls us to here. Right? It's a disposition that says, I'm willing to lay aside myself in order that I might put the needs of others above my own. Right? That doesn't mean that you don't take care of yourselves, but in order that we don't try to qualify this passage to death, what it does mean is that as Christians, we're called to live a lifestyle that reprioritizes our lives in such a way that we give our attention, our, our focus to others in the church. Right, I read that and I just go, I have to breathe after I read that passage because it's like, whew, that's hard. It's convicting, but it's necessary. Because unless we learn to shape our lives this way, this, with this self-emptying and self-denying humility, the type of relationships that Paul calls us to here can't be maintained. But you notice, secondly, where he tapes, takes us. This type of life is not simply a matter of behavior modification. But it's actually the very same kind of thinking that Christ himself had. That's why, secondly, if we're, if we're to keep and maintain relationships in the church, our attitudes and actions must be fundamentally shaped by the gospel. You see this in verse 5. Paul says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. In, in Paul's theology of the gospel, that is the, the, the gospel, the work that Christ did in order to save his people from their sins, Paul sees the gospel as not merely the, the grounds of the Christian salvation or the, the, the very means by which we are brought back into a relationship with God, but he also sees the gospel as the shape that the Christian life must take. Right? The, the gospel not only saves us, but it shapes us. In other words, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is the shape that the Christian life must take, not to gain God's favor, but because we have been united to His Son. You look in verse 5, literally translated, Paul says, be minded in this way, or let the same kind of thinking dominate you that dominated Christ. And we hear that, and the implicit question then is, what kind of thinking dominated Christ? Right? You want to know what, how Christ thought? Paul tells us. He unpacks for us the mind of Christ. We look down, and in order to understand this, we look down in verse 6. He starts by pointing us to Jesus' position. Verse 6, Have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. 
Right? Paul, Paul is speaking here of Jesus sharing in glory with the Father and the Spirit. Right? We know and celebrate Christ as the God-man who is equal in power and glory and in divinity with the Father and the Spirit. We think about this glory and never in all of creation did any human ever share such an exalted position as that of Christ. But what did he do? He did something completely unexpected. He didn't assert his rights that he held because of his position, nor did he use his title as a means of exploitation for some type of selfish gain or advantage. Right In our culture, there's an entitlement mentality, entitlement mentality that says either you must give me something or that is too beneath me to do that. But Christ here wipes entitlement out of the Christian's vocabulary. Because what does he do? Verses 7 to 8. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and being found in the likeness of and, and being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Theologians refer to this as Christ's humiliation. Right? If there was anyone who was in the place of entitlement, it was Jesus himself, but instead he empties himself of all the radiant splendors and glories of eternity in order to do what? To veil that glory and take the form of a servant. We think about his incarnation when Christ entered into human history and came down to accomplish our redemption. Now, it would have not been a shock for those in the Greco-Roman culture to hear this message of that Paul says in one sense uh, that a God had become a man. There would have been stories, and we know that they're stories, told of Zeus and Hermes. But what would have been a shock would be to hear that God, the one true and living God, stooped so low as to take the form of a slave. That was shocking. It completely turned every sense of hierarchy on its head. It was a, it was a completely upside-down way of thinking, especially as we see in verse 8, that so low did Jesus stoop on our behalf that He went to the cross to accomplish the salvation that you and I don't deserve. The cross was the most horrific form of death in this period of time. Right? It, was, it was an embarrassing thing to be crucified. You're hung naked as a criminal. Before the watching world, it meant, it meant that you were to be put on public display for intense shame and humiliation. Yet you realize that this is what Jesus did for the likes of you and me. You think about the old hymn, Bearing sin and scoffing rude, In my place condemned he stood. Think about all that happened on the cross. He became poor so that we might become rich. He became of no repute so that one day we would share in his kingdom. He offers us life so that he offers his life so that we might have life. He bears our sin and our punishment that we might be free. The whole point of Paul recounting for us this downward trajectory that Jesus took is for us to be so taken back by what Christ has done that, there is, that there's nothing that he could ask us to do that wouldn't be too great of a sacrifice for us to offer. So you pull this together. And what's the point? Paul wants us to dig down so deep into the mind of Christ so that as we take it on for ourselves, our lives begin to be radically shaped by the gospel. This is what scholars call the cruciform life or cruciformity. One scholar, he says this, to be in Christ is to be a living exegesis of the narrative of Jesus, a new performance of the original drama of exaltation, 
that follows humiliation. Of humiliation as the renunciation of rights and selfish gain in order to serve. Now, in order to make this plain and practical, I found it very helpful to use this model that I took from Paul Miller's book called The J-Curve. You'll see the, this on the slide. It'll come up here in a moment. Just keep it like that for a second. First, let's look at the passage that we just studied in light of this model. Right, this, this will sort of serve a baseline for us and understand what I'm talking about in regards to the J-Curve. You look at the J and you start at the bottom of the J over here. We understand what Paul says in light of this. And we think about Jesus. Jesus who, starting at the very, this side of the J, Jesus who was in the form of God, does not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but what does he do? He takes a downward trajectory. He empties himself, takes the form of a servant, being found in human form, And he subjects himself to death on a cross. He he lives in the bottom of the J. He stoops low. But what happens? Through his humiliation comes exaltation. God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. This is is the the gospel-shaped life. It's a life of dying and rising with Jesus. Now, Paul models this actually for us here in in Philippians, but I think more clearly probably in 2 Corinthians 4. If we're just thinking about 2 Corinthians 4, and we put this on the J-curve, don't don't move forward yet, but we put this on the J-curve, when Paul's talking about ministry in the church, if you read through 2 Corinthians, you know that ministry is difficult. Serving others in the church is hard. And so Paul, if if we're to put his life on the J-curve, okay, the ministry starts on this side. Paul says, I've been commissioned by God to serve the churches. But what trajectory does his life take? It goes down. Paul says that I'm actually, as I serve the church, I'm being given over to death for the sake of the church. You know Paul's life. He lays out in 2 Corinthians 11 this catalog of suffering that he walks through for the sake of the gospel and the sake of the church. And as he embraces the ministry of Christ, it doesn't go to exaltation. No, it goes down into humiliation and into suffering. But it doesn't stop there. Because when Paul talks about church ministry, He says, I'm dying, I'm dying, but it's so that others might live. I'm giving my life for the sake of the church. Why? So that the people of the church might live. That is what it means to love. At the heart of love is substitution. Just as Christ gave himself for us, what do we do? We give ourselves for the sake of others. As we die, others are made alive. We stoop low so that they might be brought up. The life of the cross maps out Paul's life for him. You work through all his letters, he he lives out the cross-shaped life. He lives the J-curve. So let's think about ours. Let's think about our lives. You start maybe, for example, with a commitment to the local church. You're called to serve in the local church. So you you actually start here on the J-curve. You're asked to do something perhaps by the pastor or by someone in the church. And maybe your your initial response is, I don't think I'm going to do that. Maybe you think, "That's that's too below me. You know what the problem with that is? At that moment, what you want is glory. And the, only, and, and, and the main problem with that is that you're, you're climbing the J-curve the wrong way. You try to climb the J-curve the wrong way instead of actually stooping low and serving. Here's what happens. And go ahead and press the next thing on the slide. You begin to feel entitlement. You begin to feel pride. And you begin to feel a sort of self-assertion. Things that are completely contrary to the gospel. And you know what happens as those things grow? relationships crumble. 
But what if you enter the narrative of Christ? What if you actually begin to say, okay, I'm going to follow Jesus. And I'm going to serve the church as he served us, as he served me. You know what happens? You start here at the J-curve, and you actually begin to stoop. And you know what happens? It's in that moment that you actually meet Jesus. You're following on the way to Jesus. If you can pull the, slide, pull the next thing on the slide. You begin to live in the suffering, sharing in the sufferings of Christ. And go ahead and press the next thing. You're dying with Christ. And the next one, you're made like Christ. Right? You're actually being brought into, as Paul will say in Philippians 3, the fellowship of his suffering. And you know what the beautiful thing about this is? That as you die with him and you meet him in that suffering, you're made more like him. And you know what happens as you die? You begin to rise as well. Right? This isn't a doom and gloom message. If you learn to die, you actually begin to know what it really means to live. And not only do you begin to know what it really means to live, you actually begin to enable others to live. And you know what happens when others live? Actually, relationships thrive. And as relationships thrive within the church, Christ is glorified. The only way that happens, however, is if we stoop low is if we actually begin to embrace the cross-shaped life. You might take this and apply this very same thing, not only to life in the church, but to marriages. Right? So, take the J-curve and apply it to your marriage. I come home from work, a long day of pastoring, hard counseling sessions. You know what the first thing I want to do is? I want to kick my shoes off. I want to sit on the couch while my poor wife has been at home with my crazy two-and-a-half-year-old with twins growing in her. But you know what happens if I walk in and completely ignore all that stuff? You know what actually the kind of attitude I have? Contrary to the gospel. I begin to grow in entitlement. I worked so hard today. You should serve me. I grow in pride. Do you know who I am? I'm a pastor at Parkside. I begin to assert myself. And you know what happens? My relationship with my wife begins to fracture. So reverse that. Pull up in my driveway. Hard day at work. I think to myself, what do I need to do when I go through that door? I need to, I need to die. I need to die to myself. I need to die to the entitlement, the pride, the self-assertion. I need to die with Jesus in order that what? When I go through that door, my wife lives in order that our relationships thrive, in order that what? Christ is glorified in our marriage. The only way to do that, however, is for me to die before I walk through that door. Right, see, in my opinion, outside of the cross, there's no greater picture of this than the life of Jesus in John 13. The very start of the Upper Room Discourse, if you remember what Jesus does, he actually models this before the cross because what he does in John 13 is actually an acted parable of the cross. Right? It's amazing how in John 13, Jesus, uh, John, when he's talking about what Jesus is about to do, he says, Jesus, knowing that he had come from God and was going back to God, does something crazy. He disrobes himself. He puts on a servant's cloth and he steps down and kneels down and washes the disciples' feet. Now, all things being equal, it should have been the other way around. He's God and his people should have been washed. His disciples should have been washing his feet. But what does he do? Takes the form of a servant and washes poop-covered feet because they would have been trumping around in the mud and poop. What is, he, what is he doing? He's modeling the J-curve. He's modeling what it means to serve. He's actually explaining the shape of the Christian life. Friends, that's the key to our relationships in the church. 
to die and rise day to day with Jesus. And often, we get it upside down. Bruce Thielman, who was the pastor of First Presbyterian Church, actually in Pittsburgh, he tells the story of a conversation he had with one of his lay people in the congregation who was actively involved in the life of the church. And the person mentioned to him saying, you know, preachers talk a lot about giving, but when it comes down to it, it all comes down to basin theology. Not basic theology, basin, B-A-S-I-N, B-A-S-I-N. And Thielman, puzzled, looks at the man and asks, Basin theology, what do you mean by that? And the man replies, Remember what Pilate did when he had the chance to acquit Jesus? He called for a basin and he washed his hands of the whole thing. But Jesus, the night before his death, called for a basin and proceeded to wash the disciples' feet. It all comes down to basin theology. And which one will you use? That's really the question that lays before us tonight. Christ has redeemed us by his blood. He's brought you into the family called the church. He's united you to himself. And the question is, will you seek to maintain unity and keep those relationships intact by taking the form of a servant? Or will you wash your hands of the whole thing and say, it's just not worth my time? Remember in the Bible, there's no crown without a cross. There's no glory without suffering. There's no discipleship without cross-bearing. And there's no unity or relationships maintained without self-emptying humility. So as you think about it, the question is, will you actually climb the J-curve in the wrong way? Or will you enter into the narrative of dying and rising with Jesus on a day-to-day basis? Because, friends, that is how you actually keep and maintain relationships in the church. Well, I leave those things with you, so let me pray for us, and I will turn this over to whoever comes up after me. Lord, we have thought about a lot And we know that these things are hard. And so, Lord, we pray for your grace, that by the grace of the Spirit, that you would actually etch these things into our hearts so that we might be more like Christ and actually see the church and the local body thrive. I pray that for Parkside Church. I pray that for this church. Lord, would you help us to do that? And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.